Thanks, Dale, and it's a privilege to be here. And back in September when we chose this topic, that was a lot easier at that point to put this last word at the end, and maybe we should have a different word now of survivability or, or stopping the bleeding. And I guess is what, what my attempt is through this is uh, just we're going to try and tackle a number of issues as we go through. I know there's a number of nutritionists and real, uh, extremely talented people that work with this every day as well. And, again, there's been a lot of conversations about what things that we can be doing nutrition-wise to help with feed costs and, and uh, help with some of the economics at the farm level. One of the things, and I'm not going to spend a great deal, but in the whole feed efficiency area, um, there's obviously a lot of things involved. And again, when we talk about feed efficiency, it's really driven off of, of uh, several factors. And one of those certainly, again, when we talk about feed efficiency, obviously the amount of feed versus what actually the animal puts down in its body for growth. But it can come from a variety of factors. One, simply just having a high feed disappearance. We could have a low average daily gain or several other factors. And uh, we've kind of used this chart recently, I guess, as we've put together to look at potential. And there's others probably out there of all the factors that are going to come in and start driving our, our feed efficiency response. And for today, um, I'm going to mainly focus on different nutritional strategies. But I think it's important to recognize that each one of these is an important piece. And that, again, for many of you that are uh, obviously still in the industry, uh, you're very good at, at these. And again, I think it's a good tune-up when we get into challenging times like this as we re continue to evaluate all the aspects that drive feed efficiency. And again, I'm going to focus more on some of the nutritional aspects. So kind of for an outline of things today, I'm doing a kind of a rapid fire of a number of different topics. Again, when we look at the corn and soybean meal price, uh, both moving up together, what do we do? And I'm going to talk just briefly on different ingredient evaluation. I want to focus a little bit on added fat use, synthetic amino acids, distillers, glycerol, as well as dried whey in the nursery. I'm going to round some things off with talking about feed budgeting and phase feeding, uh, particle size and the importance that we need to reevaluate particle size on a continual basis and the amount of feed efficiency advantage we can gain from that. Um, continually monitoring that. Feeder adjustment, obviously genetics is going to have a big role. Market weights, I'm not going to spend any time on those, but certainly important as we look at feed efficiency. So as we look at alternative ingredients, it's a balancing act. You know, we're going to get the question all the time, what else can I put in the diet? And again, it depends on what else is potentially out there. As we typically see, alternatives run up just as fast as price as corn and our protein products. And oftentimes, if we're on the front side of it, we can get them in and they're very economical in the diet. The one thing we need to main, if we put something else in, we need to make sure it stays economical because everybody else gets on the bandwagon too. And oftentimes alternatives, bakeries or mids, soy hulls, different things we may use, oftentimes can run up in price just as fast and then be more of a cost than a benefit. And so as we look at alternatives, we need to look at all the costs, different processing, how are we going to store them, uh, quality control that we're not working uh, with uh, anything that's going to bring mycotoxins or other type of uh, problems in with. So as we look at alternative ingredients, and I'm going to talk about distillers. I have about five, six slides. Again, it's uh, probably we look in terms of a feed ingredient that's used. And I'm not sure it's an alternative anymore. It's more of a standard in most places, uh, uh, certainly on a regional basis. Um, you know, in Kansas, we have a total, I think, of eight ethanol plants. Um, distillers grains has not been economical to use in swine diets at all until very recently. And so, again, we're, even though Kansas is borders Nebraska, we're close to Iowa, Missouri, where there's a lot of plants, it's very regionalized in terms of where some of that pricing is going to be. Fat and oils, again, obviously fat gives us much greater energy than corn itself. Um, use is dramatically reduced. Uh, we look at where fat price has gone over the last year. That amount that is used is greatly reduced. And I'm going to talk about its use and maybe how we can best, and actually starting to price back in in terms of our calculations in the early grower period. And then we look at the types of oils out there. Certainly there's a number out there. Um, and again, we don't have any problems using AV, different yellow greases, as long as we have a good handle on quality control. 
Here's a whole list of other ingredients from wheat mids. I know a number of people will use wheat mids, especially in later finishing. Again, as we look at some of those costs, uh, again, it's pretty regional in terms of where that may or may not price in. Bulk density is a big problem with our fiber ingredients. It simply takes more room for the given volume, and so we have to watch bulk density. Uh, the bakery byproducts, certainly in some areas they're available, some they're not. Um, we need to make sure it's somewhat consistent. We have a good handle of how to best utilize them. In a lot of cases, they can be very good, but again, uh, pretty specialized whether a mill maybe does or doesn't carry any sort of bakery byproduct. Meat and bone meal can certainly play as an alternative. Again, availability. And again, we're still, we're still looking at a small inclusion level, you know, 5, 10% of the diet most typically. So again, we're not, uh, in any of these, we're not replacing huge amounts of our corn and soybean meal, but things that maybe potentially have uh, some uh, smaller incremental benefits. Grain screenings, again, the variability, potential mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are always typically found in our damaged kernels in the dust. And so if you have grain dust, uh, uh, a lot of cattle feeders will get that and work it into silage and different wet products. The instance of mycotoxins in our dust are extremely high, and that's where they get concentrated. Off-quality grains like test weight, we can get along really good utilizing those grains as well. Uh, we really have to drop off in test weight before we see some problems. One of the big things as we get into alternatives, we need to make sure we don't have flowability issues. And again, this is a, this picture with that light's a little hard to see, but again, on the, on the clear plastic bottom of this hopper of a feed bin, that feed's just stacked straight up, won't flow out. And again, this could be a combination of grinding feed too fine, starting to work in different alternatives that simply don't flow. And we have to watch that. Uh, we don't need to cause ourselves on-farm feed manufacturing or handling problems from some alternatives. The next group of slides here I want to focus on added fat and, and how uh, I guess that we look at utilizing fat and again there's many different thoughts of fat use um, in finishing. There's different trials that show different results. I just want to present some data that, that we've been able to generate and how we utilize fat and show you an economic calculator we have available uh, for folks to use. What we typically find when we get a 2% improvement in feed efficiency for every uh, percent of added fat. Average daily gain typically we find improves more in early finishing or in the grower compared to late in finishing. And again, there's some other data that would show that to be a little different. Again, as, as we look at our combination, I'll show you kind of how we value uh, those different uh, fat usage. In our model, we have a total of nine different field experiments from two different systems. These would be commercial uh, research facilities, uh, 1,000, 1,200 head barns. We've looked at fat responses, and again, we've combined all this data to try and come up with how, in fact, feeding fat in a phase-fed system at different levels affects our profitability within those given phases. And again, this is from two systems. Uh, the pig sire lines were all of, of PIC. This uh, calculator is available on our K-State website, and for many of you have seen this before. Really, all what we do in this uh, particular case is alter our feed price. And for the purposes of today and for some of the other economic calculators I'm going to throw up, I'm going to use a price of 450 corn, 340 soybean meal, fat at 27 cents, and, and grind mix delivery at 15. And I know there's a lot of differences in price. We look at corn price where it's going, it's going to be higher than that. Bean meal kind of balances at that price. I know some people have bean meal locked in, still down the 250 range feeding, corn maybe the same way. But again, I'm going to plug in these values uh, just for this purposes. Used a carcass price uh, here in February on the board of about $55. Um, on the carcass basis. And what this here graph shows is simply the added revenue value that we would get, what we'd expect from adding either 2.5 or 5% fat in the diet. And in fact, you can see in, in right now under these economic conditions, um, it would be an advantage in our opinion to have fat in these early diets. We don't, do not have it in the later finishing and actually be costing us. You'll see if um, of values of 0 .16, uh, 16 cents, 28 cents for 2.5 percent add fat as we go to later finishing. Again, as we get into summer prices, again, for pigs being placed, and we're going to start marketing this summer, again, with prices around $75 a hundredweight, we could change that. In fact, we would drive our economics certainly up in the first two diets. That third diet would come up further as well. So again, as we look at average daily gain and, and just performance of added fat, we certainly um, need to evaluate does it fit, and there's different situations. If there's extra space, which most people are not in that situation, until recently, boy, a year ago, 
People, you couldn't find a barn. Today, people are calling, and, and, and uh, there's a number of producers in Kansas that could have any barns all over the place, different producers that we work with here in Iowa, Minnesota, the same. They're getting calls. It appears that in most cases that we may be going to be able to get some extra space in some conditions. So in those cases, we don't necessarily have to increase our diet cost if we simply have more days to get them to market. Now, if we're in a short space, uh, limited, which is again in most cases, again, then we want to value that extra gain uh, for the extra feed cost, the extra revenue driven from that market weight. And again, we would estimate that about a two and a half uh, percent added fat throughout uh, finishing will give us just over a three pound heavier pig, five percent the entire finishing, just over six. Dust control. I think this is one area that has greatly been reduced over the last uh, few years, but we typically continue to run into situations where we want to have 1% fat in for dust control. And I don't think we recognize, hey, we're just putting 20 pounds of fat in. This isn't costing us that much. If we do not have fat in there for the benefits of growth performance and have enough in to actually get a benefit for growth, we need to recognize how much dust control costs us. And it's currently at 27 cent fat, it's costing us about a buck 30 if we ran only dust control levels from 50 to 250 pounds, and even just from 120 on, about 75 cents a pig. We simply cannot afford to have dust control unless you absolutely think you have to have it. Um, you need to, I'm not saying don't do it from a health or if there's dust issues, but you need to recognize what that cost is. And again, I think most people have moved away from doing that. When fat was 15 cents, we could bear it a little bit better when it's 27. Probably going to get back over 30 this summer when we start using more fat. It's pretty hard to do. I want to switch gears and talk about synthetic amino acids. Uh, certainly with the run-up in soybean meal price, um, going to higher levels of synthetic uh, lysine, typically in our diets there would be three pounds of synthetic lysine just as a standard. Um, and again, to move to higher levels when soybean meal price when has gone up. In fact, if we plug in our corn price, bean meal at 340, Typical lysine level around uh, 95 cents, and again, these will vary um, a little bit how uh, on your purchasing. But again, I would estimate we're, we'd be saving about 60 cents a pig right now going to a high level of synthetic amino acids into the diet. This certainly can have advantages, and I know a number of people have already done this. And again, I think if not, if at these prices or close to, we need to certainly consider that. Now, if you have soybean meal locked in, all right, for some producers that did last fall and you're still working with 250 soybean meal, it'd be a cost to go up to higher synthetic amino acid levels. So again, we have to balance that. And again, also, since we're replacing, we replace about 100 pounds of soybean meal, again, when we go to higher levels, well, what are we putting in in its place? Corn, okay? Depending what your corn is purchased at, how fast you want to go through extra corn. So there's some economics of corn usage in that as well. You certainly go through more corn when we go to high synthetics, but certainly appears to be a, a viable option for many producers right now. Switch to distiller grains. Again, for many people, uh, you know, I'm not sure how many distiller trials have been done. I bet we've done 10 of them in the last three years ourselves, and everybody else is in the same situation, university and feed company-wise. I think in general, we can recognize that feeding 10% distillers probably will not hurt our performance. There's cases where it may. In most situations, we're pretty comfortable with 10%. There are several studies that have went up to 20, some studies up to 30%, and there's no problems. I would still say that the vast majority of studies done going to 30%, we do decrease performance. And again, there's just something about the palatability, the taste. If you give a diet with distillers and you put another feeder in there without distillers, they're going to go to the feeder without distillers every time. And we've clearly shown that. North Carolina State's shown that. And so we just need to recognize our cap is if we, how we want to value performance. Again, negative, but the biggest thing, and again, it's come out in the press a lot, is the difference is what happens on the carcass side. Without question, yield is impacted when we feed distiller grains, also fat quality, but most of the times we can manage some of the fat quality issues. Here's a summary of a number of experiments done uh, with the Aki Feed Group, Minnesota, um, at our shop at K-State, United Feeds, looking at different levels of distiller grain use and its impact on yield. One of the things we need to recognize, the more distillers we feed, the more our yield is going to go down. And this is, I think, a very clear indication. And again, it's an average of about 0.4% for every 10% distillers fed. So it's additive. And in fact, what that ultimately, what that means, 
Um, I'm going to skip to this slide. What that means, if we're selling a 270-pound pig, we have a dressing percent that drops by 0.4. We're going to have a lighter carcass. All right, we're going to give up just over a pound of carcass weight when we fed that 10% distillers the whole way through. All right, we value that on a carcass weight basis of 55 cents, uh, which will be next month. We're going to lose 60 cent, 61 cent advantage from feeding distillers. That's real. Okay, and so when you value distillers, I guess I would really encourage you to look at how we value this carcass yield impact. One of the ways. One of the ways that this is potentially being looked at, and there's other research going on, uh, United did a nice study looking at a withdrawal of distillers from the end uh, to get that yield back. Basically, the thought process is we feed a higher fiber ingredient. Uh, the digestive system walls basically get larger in size from that extra fiber, and thus, when that increases in weight, we lose that through the offal, and thus we don't care, capture it on the carcass weight side. The other side is it's clear when we feed a high-protein diet, Internal organs such as the kidneys and livers, they increase in size to get rid of that extra nitrogen. In fact, we're going to lose that as well. And here they did a withdrawal of either three or six weeks. At six weeks, they got it fully back. At three weeks, they got about half of that yield back. But again, we don't, if, we, if we do a withdrawal, we're talking about the, a six-week withdrawal at the end. That's the bulk of a lot of the distillers we're feeding. Okay? And so there's other research looking into how we can get around that as well. Again, what we, what we have done is put together a, a value calculator of distiller grains looking at corn, soybean meal. Again, the Monocal price, uh, from what I understand from several folks I've visited with, Monocal uh, price in here in about a month, month and a half, is going to take about a $175 jump. All right? Uh, so that price is going to be going up uh, dramatically, which is probably about 15 cents a pig. Uh, so that's not good news. Uh, limestone, again, some, some the synthetic lysine. And again, distillers, you can plug in a value, and that price varies all over the board. Okay? I used 180 for this purposes. So what it shows on approximate diet cost savings at 10, 20, 30 percent, nice drop in diet cost savings currently used in distillers. Approximate savings per pig. Again, from a buck thirty at ten percent, you know, if you think, and this does not take into account any decrease in performance. So, if we lost performance, these values are going to be much lower on our savings because we're going to give up weight. But if we assume equal performance, we could go out to there, and thus would give you a break-even price. The one thing I think is important we need to value along with this is the second component is the impact on yield. And again, if we enter a carcass price of fifty-five dollars, look at our carcass yield drag of 0.4. For every 10%, again, our economics change. And in fact, even at this price, all right, you can see that 20% distillers, if we thought we were not going to decrease performance, would still be the most economical to use. Okay? Again, and so as we look at pricing, I think we need to balance a few of these things in terms of how we're going to put the value and what we think we're really saving from distillers' use because feed cost, and we need to calculate some lost revenue if we fed it all the way through. So quick conclusions from my perspective, feeding up to 20% distillers is generally, if performance isn't reduced, the most economical at this point, even with the yield hit that we would take. Um, again, these levels may or may not de decrease performance. Most people think that it will, and for many of you, I'm sure you don't feed 20%. But again, it's something we have to evaluate is, is distiller price relative to corn if it keeps uh, staying competitive. Again, how to handle the yield impact? Do you withdraw it? Do you simply ignore the yield impact and feed it all the way through? Um, Again, the, on the carcass quality side, feeding 20% distillers itself should not put the carcass IV or the carcass softness value over 73, which is um, kind of a minimum, maximum value by some of the packers. However, if we feed an avian blend uh, a, or unsaturated fat sources along with, we certainly will, in a combination, go above that. All right. This glycerol. been a lot of topics on glycerol. We've been getting a lot of questions. And again, glycerol's availability isn't near to what the other byproducts are on the corn side. Again, it's a, as the biodiesel uh, industry keeps ramping up, there's going to be more available. Um, it's a, supposedly a colorless, odorless, sweet-tasting, viscous liquid. I would claim that that is the case when it's fresh. And I'll show a slide here in just a little bit on some not-fresh glycerol and its effects. 
much less known. There's a tremendous amount of research going on right now that's funded through the pork board, some state pork associations. Again, its price changed last fall. Um, we were getting, we could get glycerol for about six cents. We have a study starting here in 10 days with glycerol, and we were in the 12 to 15 cent range to buy it uh, per pound. We have some initial data that we've worked with looking at glycerol, and this is in a nursery pigs from 25 to 55 pounds, comparing either soy oil, glycerol, or a blend of those two. In fact, we saw a good, uh, we saw a response to feeding soy oil. You'll see a nice response to feeding glycerol. I'll be the first to tell you we would not have expected this in amount of increase when we fed glycerol. Glycerol's energy value is, we give it somewhere close to corn. It's probably a little bit better than corn, but it isn't near to what fat itself is, okay? And again, so we got tremendous performance, and we would not have expected that high, but that's what our uh, results from this study ultimately showed. We just completed a finishing study, and this will be presented uh, uh, last fall. I believe this will be presented here at Midwest meetings uh, here in a month and a half, looking at distillers in combination with uh, glycerol. We fed at 20% uh, distillers, which is the purple lines. You'll see in this case, regardless of what we did glycerol-wise, we got along pretty good at 20%. This would have been the first time in this research barn that 20% increased performance, but again, just shows you some of the variability of distillers. We look at glycerol at 5%, flat line across. We got along real well feeding 2.5% or 5% glycerol. Again, glycerol is liquid, so how much can we pump into the diet? All right, We're limited. I mean, it's a, it's a smaller type alternative, but it may have uh, some potential. This is a second study we completed, and actually this was uh, done, um, again, at our commercial barns up at, at Pipestone, looking at glycerol at 0, 2.5, and 5% with or without fat. You'll see when we fed it without fat, look what happened as we increased glycerol. We started to crash average daily gain. And we did not know why in the world this would happen when our other studies, we got along pretty darn well. And again, in the case where we actually fed fat, they actually came back and did very well. And one of the reasons for that is if you look at glycerol when you first buy it, it's in this vial, it's very clear forming. And actually, if you taste it, there's really not much of a taste at all to it. This was, in, this was a picture from a ruminant nutritionist who's also been doing a bunch of uh, glycerol work, and this is from a tote that we had uh, after three months, and this was actually in a refrigerated sample. It turned black. And in the words of our uh, ruminant nutritionist who, also, who took a, a tiny taste of that, uh, six hours later, he still could not get that rancid taste out of his mouth, and he said he'd rather lick a cat's ass next time than taste that stuff. <laughs> so we know that there is, direct quote too, uh, we know there is maybe some potential storage issues with glycerol. Fresh glycerol does well. Again, if it starts to turn, we know we're going to have some problems. All right, enough glycerol. Dried whey. And again, I'm in the back end of the nursery phase. I think it's worth mentioning on the dry whey side. Again, we've, we've used, we've advocated dried whey use uh, a long time. And again, there's no question dried whey helps improve performance, that it helps get, keeps pigs rolling along. But also, historically, when we've used dried whey, the price hasn't been 50 cents to 75 cents a pound either. And in fact, if we look at what even this last year, again, verified the typical whey responses, if we do not feed whey in that 15 to 25 pound pig, we're going to have a half a pound to a pound less growth. We know that. Um, but again, if we look at whey price, where it's been over this last year, uh, the added advantage of, of weight did not compensate for, the, in fact, the increase in diet cost. Typically, and we go back to our historical work, weight needs to be priced around 35 cents a pound to be break even. And again, we, we've certainly been over that over the last year, year, you know, or plus, and so we need to evaluate. And some people, and I recognize, and I don't have, we have, that doesn't mean we've pulled away. There's some systems that have. The vast majority of our producers are still feeding the same amount of whey. But I think we need to recognize, if we're looking at some cost centers, maybe where that comes in. A lot of different, there's a lot of text here, and I apologize for that. Basically, there's a lot of alternatives that may be out there. We need to make sure that they work, and that they're as effective as lactose, um, and make sure we're getting the same response. Again, some folks have gone and, and, and divided that 15 to 25 pound diet into two. In the first diet, they'll maintain their level of weight, basically from 15 to 20 pounds, and then pull the weight out from 20 to 25 to capture some diet savings. The important thing, though, is if you do that, you don't just dump them back on high soybean meal. You have to maintain the level of specialty fish meal, 
blood meal, especially protein products, to that pig's 22 to 25 pounds um, in order for growth. And so again, potential uh, cost savings there. Also, a pig over 25 pounds should never be fed lactose. There is no way in the world that that pig cannot digest soybean meal as effectively at that point. Oh, it, they can be fed it. They'll utilize it great. There's just no reason from a cost standpoint once a pig hits 25 pounds. Feed budgets and phase feeding. Obviously, many, we feed a lot of diets, and this is nothing new to you. Again, we, don't, we want to minimize um, the amount of over-budgeting, especially if we're budgeted for X amount of pounds for X diet. Uh, we typically try and match that up with feed deliveries as well with transportation costs where it's gone. But again, we need to make sure we're not over-budgeting. We need to make sure we're adjusting groups properly based on the number that are entering so we're not to getting off on our feed budgets. And again, we do not want to make sure under... Uh, if we start underfeed budgeting heavily, then we're going to start feeding deficient diets, uh, costing ourselves some potential growth performance. Again, some people have gone to additional diets during this time. Again, for most people, you already have, you know, a, a vast amount of diets from start to finish. Um, in that case. Again, there's just our typical nursery budget. Um, again, even with some of the higher, heavier wean pigs, we've been very reluctant to go away from starting on our typical SCW or that initial pelleted diet. The thing we have to remember on wean pigs is a 15 pound wean pig, the day it's weaned, is different than a 15 pound pig that's been on feed for three, four days that was weaned earlier. All right. We still got to get that plasma. We got to get those specialty ingredients into them. But again, we want to stay stringent on our budgets. Split sex feeding. Uh, many questions as we start filling wean to finish barns and, and start pulling from different sources. Uh, should we continue to split sex feed? Based on our calculations, if you can fill a barn within less than seven days of age to get that budget tight, we think that split sex feeding certainly still holds those economic advantages. If we start spreading that out over too far, if we're splitting barrels and gilts going different directions, then trying to line feed budgets up over pigs that have been put in barns over a two, three week period, all right, we're, we're way over budgeting some of our initial diets to make sure those last pigs get that feed. In fact, we would just assume at that point, go ahead and mix X feed and roll through. Particle size. Again, uh, we've been fortunate to have a grain science program where we're able to do a lot of uh, particle size work. And again, I'm sorry this picture doesn't show up with the, the light that's shining on it. But again, the different particle sizes, uh, again, from 500 up to 1,200 is pictured here. 1,200, we'd have half crack corn, um, kernels, even maybe some whole kernels slipping through. Those would be indications we certainly would have some problems. The general rule of thumb, for every 100 micron change, feed again will change by 1.2%. And this is something, especially in times right now, uh, we need to make sure that our feed manufacturing is meeting our uh, micron desired size. This is data from 85. If we ran the same trial today, I would suspect we'd see the same response. And again, just to show the dramatic difference, if we have a micron of around 700 or less, 700 to 1,000 or 1,000, look at the differences in feed to gain, all right? It is a real effect. And that's why we continue to harp, harp, harp on particle size, particle size analysis, making sure your mill is getting it ground correctly. In fact, why is it? You'll see there's just simply higher digestibility and nutrients of dry matter, energy, and protein when we digest, uh, are able to grind that down. We recommend somewhere around a 700 micron average with a range from 600 to 750. Again, so what does that mean dollars and cents wise? If we change 100 microns, that's seven pounds of uh, feed for a finishing pig. That's about 68 cents in the current feed costs that I calculate off sheets last week. So again, um, we like to have that, um, if you're doing on-farm uh, processing, again, there's different ways. And this is the full sieve test when you send in to different labs. Um, at K-State, we analyze thousands of samples continually for producers all across the U.S. and Kansas uh, to monitor particle size. Some operations have gone to a simply on-site a one sieve, some also a three sieve test where you simply measure um, the amount going in, we're going to shake that, and then measure how much falls on each one of those screens. The problem we've seen with the one screen test is that it actually isn't very accurate. In fact, we can see when we did an analogy of, of a one sieve method compared to a full stack, the actual amount of particle size is in that range where it should be fallout more than 100 microns from what the actual was. 
or a 1 sieve test just isn't very darn accurate. We put a 3 sieve test together and 95% of the samples fell within 100 microns. It does a really good job of measuring on farm if you do on farm processing. Very simple way of doing that. And again, um, we have uh, um, uh, uh, sample procedures up on our website for the 3 sieve method and we have a number of producers that have adopted that. Again, pretty basic stuff, decreasing particle size. We're going to increase surface area. We have a greater ability for digestive capabilities. Feed efficiency will improve. Now, what's the problem? More isn't better. It's like anything else we've talked about today. More is not necessarily better. We start getting too fine in a mash feed. Um, obviously, dustiness will increase. We're going to have an increase in electrical costs, time to grind. Uh, flowability gets poor, obviously, the, the finer feed gets. Obviously, gastric ulcers are a concern if we get too fine. So there's a balance in there, and I think around that 600 to 750, we're real confident we minimize these disadvantages. Feeder adjustment, all right? We continue to harp every time. You'll probably hear one of us from K-State talk. We can't get by without throwing our feeder adjustment slide in. Again, I think for the most part, we do a very good job at this. We like to try and minimize to about 25% pan coverage. If you want to have pitchers to print out and stick in barns and laminate, we have all sorts of pitchers up on our website, and this is very common. Uh, we'll print them off so no one argues about what the feeder should look like. Uh, different growers, different employees, you stick it on the wall, and you tell them, this is what I want my feeder to look like. And you can do that and print off different types. We, uh, the tube feeders, uh, and the quote of Steve Dreets, if your fingers don't hurt, you're not adjusting feeders enough. And again, uh, all the calculators that I talked about, and uh, we don't, I wasn't able to hook into the internet just to show, but to go to kswine.org, uh, pretty simple to find those different calculators, and you can use them however you like to value different ingredients. Or if you have questions, just let us know.